we're on. <laughs> Good morning, Grace Church. We're glad to be with you again. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, we have a couple of announcements as we start off today. We are going to be starting a study of the book of Isaiah. And um, John Ray says it will specifically be a tool to guide us as we recalibrate as a church and as individuals. We're also going to be emphasizing study practices, habits, journaling, notes, and preparation. So you might want to get yourself a fresh new journal or something to kick off the new year and your study. We're also going to be offering a new Discovering Grace class. And so even virtually, we can uh, clarify what it is to be part of Grace Church. And so if you would like to participate in that, please message Stacy at gracechurchnwa.org. And also gather your communion elements. Oh yeah. We have a little bit of grape juice here and some crackers and a grape tray that my daughter made years ago. So uh, as we worship today, you might want to go and grab those things so you're ready to participate in communion. Hey, one other thing too, um, in respect to that study of Isaiah, we actually have a little video clip of some of the people that are involved with your teaching team. The people are putting the messages together every week and they want to talk to you a little bit about Isaiah. So Stacy, do you want to roll that? I'm excited to look holistically at the book of Isaiah because I've only ever studied it before in small sections. So I'm looking forward to what understanding the book as a whole will reveal and help piece together. I'm really uh, looking forward to the study of Isaiah that we're going to adventure into as a church this year. Um, I don't know that I've ever really fully studied all the way through Isaiah, so that's part of what's exciting me. But I also know it's just a, it's a book, uh, the scripture that's filled with pain and promise and prophecy. Um, and so there's just, um, and there's a poetry to it as well. Um, it's often quoted in the New Testament at different points in time. And so, yeah, it's going to be an exciting year. I am genuinely looking forward to going through the book of Isaiah. Um, the last time I did it, I was hunting and searching for any messianic prophecies and sort of forgot the context. And so I'm looking forward to going through this time around, seeing the text in context, historically, and within scripture. I am looking forward to reading through Isaiah because when I began the healing work of working through a lot of religious trauma, I kind of put this book out of my mind. I put it in the category of it's too stressful and too hard and too confusing. Um, but I believe that now I have a safe space with my community at Grace Church that I can uh, read through this book and be challenged and continue to heal. And I'm very excited. As we dig into the book of Isaiah here in the new year, there's a couple things that I'm really looking forward to. One, I've always felt like uh, the book's kind of confusing. Uh, it's confusing because it's laid out kind of strange, and it's also been confusing to me because God seems kind of angry in the book. And so I'm looking forward to clearing up some of my confusion uh, around those things and what's trying to be communicated uh, through the prophet of Isaiah. And then two, I'm really looking forward to uh, understanding a more clear picture of the person of Jesus from this lens from the Old Testament and um, the person of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus, and what that means for us uh, who claim to follow Jesus. Welcome back, everybody. I'm hoping the um, testimonies of, of what the teaching team members are hoping to get out of the Isaiah study is inspirational to you. Um, uh, there's nothing more powerful, I think, for us as a church to walk, than to walk through the Word together. And in, uh, particularly as we set it, are setting ourselves up for the new year, you know, Teresa and I has, have gotten into a couple of conversations, you know, with folks as it relates to, um, you know, just, just to the new year in general and what we, 
you know, what we anticipate. Um, and, and I know that right now for me personally, um, there's a lot of unknowns still. Uh, there are a lot of things out there that um, are causing me to wonder and reflect. And um, I do know that right now we're still broken. And we've had a couple of people that we visited with say, you know, I don't know how to love the people necessarily that I disagree with. And so the message that we get from Arlena, uh, from, from Arlena today is going to be super helpful in that. But um, I picked the songs this morning in that in that vein. So uh, sing along with us and worship from your home. Make a little racket. Uh, and we'll enjoy that together. Search 
me, God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Yeah, hey, um, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, and I'm going to let her introduce our wonderful guest teacher for this Sunday. All right, Marlena Graves. Um, wrote a book called The Way Up is Down, published in July of 2020. It is apparently tied for the 2021 Christianity Today Award of Merit book in this category of spiritual formation. She is a writer, professor, and activist. And I picked a benediction today from Sarah Bessie, so I thought I would pull Sarah Bessie's commentary on Marlene Graves' book in person. She says, she is bold and pastoral, a rare combination. And best of all, she is the real deal. She has never lost sight of the people for whom the gospel is such good news. And in her words, there is an invitation for all of us. Hi, my name is Marlena Graves today. I'm so excited to be your guest preacher this morning or whenever you see the sermon. I'm going to start with our scripture reading this morning. It's from Matthew 4, 12 through 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he went into Galilee. While in Galilee, he moved from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali. The way by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. And on those who sit in the region and shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach the message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I come to you in the name of Jesus, who when he greets his people, his disciples, he says, peace be with you. I come as a messenger to remind you that when God comes to you, and that our God is a God that is always coming, as Carlo Corretto so beautifully proclaimed. When God comes to you, know that God greets you and embraces you with peace and with goodness. You are a joy and a delight, the apple of God's eye. God longs to unfold you and embrace you in goodness, to make you feel safe. As Dallas Willard said, the safest place to be is the kingdom of God, to be with God. Sometimes I wanna rush in and hide in the fold of God's garment. It's the way a little boy or a child, a girl, the way that a child might press her or himself into the folds of the mother's skirts. When the child feels timid, or afraid or anxious. That's the kind of God that we serve. And I wanna remind you of that good news this morning. That is the God that greets you. And I want you to know that your own presence is a reminder to me of the goodness of God. I've heard things about your church. And although there's a huge difference between me speaking to you in person and on Zoom, I'm quite happy to be here on Zoom and to be with you. And I hope that someday that I can speak to you in person. 
before I want to begin, I want to thank John Ray and the others on your uh, team at church that uh, lead your teaching and your studies. I want to thank you all for having me here this morning. I'm very, very grateful. Today, I wanted to start by speaking a little bit about one of my favorite verses from scripture. Here it is from Matthew 6, 22 to 23. This is Jesus speaking. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? That was from the NIV. I'm going to also read it to you from Eugene's Peterson, Eugene Peterson's The Message Translation. He says it like this. Your eyes are the windows into your body. If you open your eyes broad and bright in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and in distrust, your body is like a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows shut, what a dark life you will have. Now I have to tell you what, our temptation, my temptation is to live squinty eyed in distrust, especially with people that have hurt me and those people whose beliefs and attitudes that we find distasteful, abhorrent, and even nauseating. Now, I want you to hear me loud and clear. What I'm about to say does not apply to those that are in situations of physical, sexual, spiritual, or emotional abuse in whatever form it takes. I will tell people if you meet me in person or if you come to me in any other way, that do whatever it takes to get the help you need. I am for you and I will help you if I can help you in any way, I'll do it. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about abusive situations. And now that uh, I've said that, let us ask God to open the ears of our hearts so that we might hear what the spirit is saying to us. Lord, we ask in your holy name that you would open up your word to us and that you would guide and direct us for what you have for us this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God is one. Amen. I'm asking for us to have ask God to help make space in our lives for the people that we'd rather not bother with. And maybe someone comes to your mind right away. I'm asking God to help us see them with eyes open, not squinty eyed. The category of those people, the people that we deem those we'd rather not bother with is different from each for each one of us, depending on our situation. For some, it's Republicans. For others, it's Democrats. For some, it's a certain denomination and what they stand for that makes us want to vomit. I want us to examine how we see those who produce a visceral, a gut reaction in us, a negative one. And again, I'm not speaking of abusive situations. My question to you and to myself today is, with God's help, can we open our eyes and afford those people some humanity? Can we catch ourselves when we refuse to let them climb out of the pigeonholes that we've made for them? Lord knows that I don't want to be pigeonholed. If as Jesus says, and I believe what he says, that my eyes are the lamp of my body, and that if my eyes are healthy, my whole body's full of light. But if my eyes are dark, if I narrow my eyes squinty eyed, I'm full of darkness, then I best pay attention. I want to tell you a story from my own life. I wrote a, about it a little bit, oh, some months ago this summer. 
but I think it makes the point I'm trying to make today. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you two stories, but I'll start with the most recent one. A little over a year ago, my husband was preparing to go to bed and my girls were already in bed. In fact, I was laying down in bed, but I got up from my bed and made the 15 minute drive to join a group from my church to meet asylum seekers at the Greyhound bus station here in Toledo, Ohio. We were there from about 10, 15 p.m. to midnight or later, sometimes 1230 on Monday nights. I translated from Spanish to English and then from English to Spanish as asylum seekers arrived and switched buses. Sometimes we were only there 10 minutes. Other members of the group from my church handed out food, some over-the-counter medication like Advil or Tylenol, blankets, toys because it was cold smiles, a cell phone to use, or they would help figure out the bus schedules. And all the while I was doing this translation. Every Monday night, I saw their faces. I saw often Mary, Jesus, and Joseph fleeing murder, violence, hunger, and poverty. Some asylum seekers traveled for months to make it to the Mexico-US border. I talked to a lady that walked almost three months on foot, slept outside and in villages with her son to make it to the border. But that's not the story for today, that's for another time. So some traveled by themselves, others traveled in groups or caravans because they wanted to be safe. By the time we were at the bus station, the asylum seekers were on their final leg of the journey. They were traveling to meet their sponsors. They had already presented themselves for asylum at the US border. And they're waiting, they were waiting for a court hearing here in the United States once they reached their sponsors. And so I want to tell you about Yasmin, who had been a preschool teacher in Honduras. When she learned that her two-year-old little boy's babysitter was going to sell him to a drug cartel, I don't remember how she found out, she split. She abandoned her whole life and fled to the U.S. to seek asylum. She hired a coyote or a coyote, a human smuggler, to get her and her son to the border for $7,500. Now, $7,500 is a lot of money, but it is a lot of money when you have no job. It's a lot of money in Honduras, but in the United States, when you don't have a job and when you're an asylum seeker, $7,500 is astronomical. And if she did not pay that coyote back, he knew where her parents and her family lived and he would get that money out of them, no matter what, whether it was violence, threats or bribes. So she was in the crosshairs to pay him back. But what I learned about Yasmin and so many others is that families would do whatever it took to keep their children safe, to provide food for them if they were in poverty, to keep them from being trafficked or raped or murdered. And you know what? I bet you'd do the same thing. I have three girls, 13, eight, and six, and I would do, my husband would do whatever it takes to make sure that they were safe. In Yasmin, I saw a desperate mom sacrificing everything for a child. She was not a threat to United States. She wasn't a criminal. She was an asylum seeker. And I can't even talk, begin to talk to you today about the role that the United States has played in destabilizing the governments in South and Central America that also added to the situation we have today. We do have a role that we've played and it's not great. And so when I hear people downplay the situation, ignore them, call them criminals, separate them from their families and justify it, even so-called Christians, I can feel my heart starting to harden. 
my heart hardened towards them, especially if they name the name of Christ. Because most of them have never witnessed what the asylum seekers are going through firsthand. They've never talked to them. They don't know their plight. And so my heart gets hard when I hear people say and do things, when the government does things, when Christians sponsor satanic policies that hurt them, demonic policies, my heart gets hard. I sense myself becoming snake-like, ready to strike. My chest tightens, my eyes narrow, but you can't see it though, because it happens on the inside, the eyes of my soul. I read in a scientific magazine that slit pupils help snakes ambush their prey. And that a smaller pupil creates a deeper field of focus. The downside, however, is that it lets less light in. I can sense the humanities, the humanity of those in my field of focus, those who set up and support policies that withhold help from people like Yasmin and her son. I can feel their humanity slipping away in me as anger wells up inside. I see the vulnerable crushed by words, posture, and policy. I have to believe that such behavior is mostly due to lack of proximity to those like Yasmin and those that are suffering with nowhere to go. But sometimes I wonder because slave masters were in close proximity to their slaves, but that didn't change the hearts of many people. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines hatred as intense hostility and aversion, extreme dislike or disgust. Hate is to find very distasteful. It is to have ill will towards another instead of goodwill, instead of the goodwill that God greets us with, the peace that God greets us with. On that definition, I have to admit that hate resides and has resided in me. Hatred damages our eyesight while it gives us the ability like a snake to laser focus on what we detest, on our prey, on the person that we hate. It also stops light from coming in. We become snake-eyed, slit-eyed, like the snakes, squinty-eyed. Do you see how the darkness starts to envelop me, to envelop us when we see only evil, including those who have hurt us? It affects how we see. As Eugene Peter said, said it closes our eyes. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not only me seeing people hurting others. I've been hurt by the church too by the very people who are supposed to be Jesus to me and to others. It was a little over seven years ago that my husband and I and many of our um, friends at a Christian workplace, a university, were thrown into the pit by what were we thought were our brothers, not close Christian brothers, but we were thrown into the pit the way Joseph was, left for dead. The chairs of the trustees of the board resigned in protest over what happened. Later on, he contacted me and said that Sean and I had done nothing wrong. We were just caught up, swept up by fundamentalists, and we were not fundamentalists. And they were trying to, uh, they did what was called a coup. They took over the university. We were swept up in it. They wouldn't have us. I was hurt. I was seething that they seemingly got away with murder. That they got away with such wrongdoing. I saw how families were financially, emotionally, and spiritually harmed. Abuse. They busted up our community of friends and we scattered throughout the United States and Canada to find work. Sean and I were whistleblowers for the wrongdoing. Um, and those in charge retaliated by finding ways to 
eliminate positions or make work miserable for us and many others. Suddenly there was no more funding for Sean's department. So we did the right thing among Christians, but we were severely harmed. We were wronged. Just like those who mistreat asylum seekers were Christians and harm, many harm. Sometimes they're one and the same people, the people that harmed us. I could feel that hatred, that dislike, that contempt, that ill will welling up in my heart. My eyes became slits. I didn't want to pray for them. I didn't want anything good to happen to them. How could good come to them when they who claim the name of Jesus have been so bad, so horrible to us and so many other people? So devil-like. I could see no good in them. I was justified. The former chair of the board of trustees even said I was. But the problem was, with my eyes becoming slits. There was no room in the end of my life for those sort of people. And with bitterness and anger making a home in me, I was in danger of the fires of hell. Notice that I didn't say it was wrong to be angry or upset. Scripture tells us be angry and do not sin. It's natural to be angry when such things happen to us. It was called for but the anger and bitterness and dehumanizing of the perpetrators in my heart began to consume me and cast me into the outer darkness. I was becoming the kind of person I didn't want to be. In fact, it was at that time in my life that I realized that all of us, all of us are canes with our own ables. Even if you can't see it on the outside, we can um, harbor anger and murder within our hearts when we've been wrong too or when other people are hurt i could be guilty and i never knew this until then of great harm if that anger and bitterness continued to blaze like a forest fire within my heart and then jesus and his kindness and goodness you know how jesus is and his truth had the gall to tell me Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Me repent? Really? What about them? Is what I said to the Lord. And you know what Jesus does when I throw up that what about them? The way that a psalmist might do it. He pulls out what he told Peter in John 21. And this is what he said to me. What is that to you, Marlena? Follow me. These people are going to be held accountable for their sins and the harms and, they, and the curses that they brought upon people in the world, families and children, if they do not repent. Paul reminds us in uh, Romans 2, 6 through 9, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence and doing good sleep glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. All of us are going to be called to account. All of us, you and me. We're going to stand before God and give an account for our life. So, I can't spend the rest of my life asking, what about them? Now, we, I can have my time to ask, what about them? And I did. But I can't spend the rest of my life asking, what about them? Jesus lovingly turned it around on me and asked, what about you, Marlena? What about you? Now, I didn't see any good in them. And if they had any good in them, I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to see it. It was equivalent to calling them good for nothings. And if you've read scripture, you know what happens when we call people good for nothings. If we take that posture, I can tell you it's not good. You can go ahead and look it up. Now I can see and feel the flames of hell licking at my feet because I had no desire to humanize them or show mercy to them, at least initially. 
because they had hurt me and hurt so many others so bad. The thing is, as our eyes begin to close, as they grow narrow and narrower into slits, our spiritual eyes, of course, it inhibits our relationship with God and other people and even creation. As the apostle John asks in 1 John 4, 20, how can we say we love God if we hate our brothers and sisters? I mean, it's, you just don't, or not really, not in that moment. Thomas Merton writes, a basic temptation, the flatly unchristian refusal to love those whom we consider for some reason or other unworthy of love. And on top of that, to consider others unworthy of love for very trivial reasons. Not that we hate them, of course, but we just refuse to accept them without inner reservations. In a word, we reject those who do not please us. So you might be saying to yourself, Marlene, I didn't have that kind of hate. I don't have that kind of hate in me, the kind of hate you had. That might be true. But do you refuse to accept those that do not please you? The people who get in your grill, When our spiritual eyesight's failing, when we are pigeonholing and growing slit-eyed, doing the very things we don't want done to us, Jesus calls us to turn, to repent, to move toward the light for the kingdom of God is near, to change. And when we repent, listen to what happens. Our spiritual eyesight is restored and eventually made better. We let more light in, so we become full of light and life. And you know what happens then? Our lit lives are like torches. They shine bright like the sun. They shine in the night. They shine the way Moses' face is shown when he spent time with God on the mountain and then came down. Well, we'll repent so that we let the light in. God will gently and lovingly draw other people to repentance in and through us. Our spiritual eyesight affects the light of our lives and the world around us. So let's repent. Repent with me. And I have to tell you something. Repentance is daily, sometimes minute by minute, daily conversion for as long as we live. Because when we repent, we'll see that the kingdom of God is always near. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Wow. Um, I don't know about you, honey. Uh, that's the second time I've heard that message. And uh, it, I admit it's, it's stung a little bit, probably rightfully so, uh, because I know for myself, there's people that I'm, I'm just struggling with, right? And, uh, you know, Marlene has called for us to kind of lead our way uh, forward through repentance, I think is really important for one for us, you know, individually, but also for us as a church. Um, you know, we're entering a new year, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, we're looking, it's what are we looking forward to, and how do we, how do we progress as a church? And uh, it's been a year that's like none other that I've ever encountered, and the whole year has just been wacky, as it has been for you all as well. And so, but in, this, in that spirit, I'm hopeful, and I really, I really hope that we can not necessarily stare and dwell at 2020 very much longer, but that we can start looking forward and do so with not without slit, slitty eyes, slit eyes. Um, I don't know, what are you, what are you thinking? <laughs> I am thinking you put people on the spot too much. <laughs> this was not yours. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so. Yeah, I think it was a great message and timely and I, I look forward to talking about it with everybody. Yeah. By the way, speaking of that, um, Stacy did put a link, a Zoom link, uh, into the, the the notes section. So after we're done today with our word time worship, uh, 
uh, it's the comment section. Uh, after we're done with our time of worship, jump in the link and we can spend a little time at least saying hello to one another, but also, you know, talking about uh, about the message of, of some more. Um, but now we're going to enter into communion um, together. And th those of us that are gathered on the call and, you know, in our homes and our families, you know, we just need to know that we're forever connected through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll also be forever connected because of our shared experiences. And we've gone through something together uh, as a church. Um, what we see here is a true picture of what the church is all about. There's people that are coming to the table this morning that are broken. There are people that are coming to the table this morning that uh, may be filled with joy and had a uh, after having a great holiday, there's just we're all coming at this from different places. But Christ and His body gives us the ability to, um, uh, you know, to come together under His headship, even though we may be very different, even though we may not agree with one another, even though we may be Republican or Democrat or all of the other great um, comparisons that Marlena gave us this morning. So, um, yeah, so let's uh, grab your communion elements. Teresa and I have ours here, our bread and our wine. And um, Jesus instructed his church to remember. Remember that his body was broken on the cross so that we might be made whole. In the act of sharing the bread, we remember his body, and so we eat. <laughs> Jesus also instructed the church to remember. Remember that the blood that, the sh that was shed on the cross made possible for forgiveness, for redemption. In the act of sharing the cup, we remember that his blood that was shed uh, was to give us that redemption. You know, Grace, we practice communion every week. Uh, it hasn't been something we've always done. We probably started it four or five years ago. But uh, it was that whole spirit of unity, that whole idea that Jesus is the way, the only way that we could ever possibly find um, community together, common union with one another. And so um, with that, um, it's also our time to remember to give. Um, you know, Grace Church, uh, you know, the, to support the mission of what we're trying to accomplish, we need each other. And as John often says, no one is without something that they can offer, and no one is, is without some, some sort of need. And so, um, you know, in that spirit, we'll, you know, we'd ask you to, to give grace graciously um, uh, without, um, without reserve to one another and to, to the church. I'm going to continue to lead us into some more worship um, with this song. Uh, it's actually, uh, I just put music to words that were written by, um, by Elena Murray. And I, I found this poem and I thought, wow, this is, it's so pointed. And it's, um, it, it moved me. And so I felt like it, if we could learn to sing it, um, it would be a way for us to remember. God, we bear the imprint of your face, the colors of our skin or your design. What we have, the beauty in our race, because we are your people, you alone divine, who stretched a living fabric on our frame. Gave to each a language and a name. Well, we are torn and pulled apart by hate because our race, our skin is not the same. But we are judged. Unequal by the state, and victims may because we own our own name. 
Humanity returns to the world. Dishonored is your living place. We share the image of your son, whose flesh and blood are ours, whatever skin. In humanity, we find our own, and in his family, our proper kin. Christ is the brother we still crucify. Let's love the language we must learn for time. Yeah, I'm uh, struggling to keep it uh, together here a little bit with that, uh, with that song. Again, uh, repentance is key. I've got to take some time myself to sit with these thoughts and to really allow that to settle into my own spirit. Thank you, Marlene. I really appreciate you and those kind and perfect words, even though they may leave a little sting. Um, uh, let's sing this last song together, and uh, then Teresa will give us the benediction, and uh, we'll join you maybe on the Zoom call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
benediction from part of some words from Sarah Bessie. And I pray that you, my friends, church, that you would experience the wild and inclusive and gener generous, invitational, disruptive, welcoming love of God, and that everything that we have embodied over this season together, the sorrow and joy, weakness and strength, that it would all fill you with such longing for God's dream for you that we can do nothing but live it out. Go in peace. See you guys on the Zoom call. Zoom link attached in the comments.